Hi everyone, thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Jessica Studney. I'm a Media Relations Manager with the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. This afternoon we're going to have a presentation from Tom Sanzillo, our Director of Finance. He'll be presenting to us today on Reading the Company 10K, ExxonMobil. A couple of things before we begin. We'd like you to please put your phones on mute. If you have any questions, please submit them to the chat section. Uh, you'll see that my name, Jessica, is actually listed as our executive director, Sandy Buchanan. So please go ahead and send those there. Um, what I'll do is I will hold questions till the end after Tom has finished his presentation. And um, also I want to share with everybody that the PowerPoint um, will be available on IEFA's website after uh, we've wrapped up today. And in addition, it will also be posted onto YouTube. So with that, I will turn it over to Tom and we can begin our presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for attending. Um, today we're going to discuss um, how to look at the, uh, the 10K form that companies um, that many of us are involved with um, file. Um, if it's an oil company or a coal mining company or a utility or a company that manages ports, um, whatever, or any kind of listed company in the United States, um, pipeline companies, they all have to file these 10K forms. Um, the purpose of the form is to, is to provide a uniform system of reporting for investors. This, and, and the investors are then able to compare companies in locations. They can compare not only energy companies, they could compare um, Exxon to Coca-Cola. They could compare um, the, um, Johnson & Johnson to Microsoft. Um, so the form is uh, very important to the organization of markets and capital in the United States we and in the world. Um, and we have a, a very different interest, our interest at IEFA. Um, and so we're, we're looking at the companies where most of us are involved in, in strategies to try to change the companies. Sometimes that changes in directions that the company um, is moving in anyway, and sometimes we're doing it in direct opposition uh, to the companies. So um, Basically, the, what I'm going to go through is the, the, uh, the, the fundamental or basic purpose of what the 10K is, how it's structured, um, and then to use the case of ExxonMobil, which is fairly topical, um, to show um, how you derive an analysis from the 10K and, and other supporting documents, and then how we've used this in the, uh, in the, um, in the campaigns. Um, so, so the idea here is that you, um, you also could begin to develop the, um, the wherewithal to develop a competent analysis um, and to, um, and to um, put that together for your organization, your work, and we'd always be willing to help. Um, you're going to see that some of this is a little bit messy, um, and then we're going to try to move from the messy into making it into a, a pretty good coherent picture. Um, so the main thing to look at is, so we have uh, um, the uh, 10K, and it's considered a comprehensive summary by the company of its financial condition. It's required to file this under the law um, and in the United States. And then there are also comparable documents worldwide. Um, most co countries that want to invite investment have something very similar to a 10K. So we've put down about 18 or 19 of them in links for you. Um, to go look at some of the bigger countries if you're interested or have been involved, and you'll begin to see how to use those web pages and find the companies you're interested in. Um, but to turn back to the United States for a minute, um, just to give you the, the, the uh, sort of a very big picture overview, um, the SEC is the Securities and Exchange Commission. That's the United States agency, uh, Securities Regulatory Agency. It was established during the Depression in the 30s. And the reason it was established was because uh, as we entered the Depression, many, 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 many investors simply lost everything that they put into the market. Um, and the analysis in the U.S. was largely it was because they had been defrauded and that the kind of information that was on the market didn't give them adequate um, uh, warnings or 
um, analysis of what was going on. So the idea in the U.S. is a, it's a free market system is that you don't want to restrict the markets, um, you don't want to direct them, but you want investors to have a fair chance to make an honest uh, an honest investment, um, and so it's the the information is not geared to um, um, uh, directing outcomes. It, it's geared towards helping investors make a decision. It's information based, and the regulation is based on that. So that you there are subpoena powers that the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission has um, in order to make sure that the information is accurate, um, and then there are standards for the accuracy. Um, they can be subpoenaed and and what have you. Um, so the um, the document, the 10K, really needs to be read with a, a few other um, documents as you get more familiar with things. The 10K is an annual filing, and so there are prior 10Ks um, for every company, and you need to sort of uh, take a look at those because they change over time, and it's in that change that really tells you where the companies are going. Um, the historical stock market returns, they're in the 10K, they're better found on websites, company websites, Yahoo Finance, because there's a more of an interactive models. Um, they also, you could also benefit substantially from the credit agency reports, Moody, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch. We use them as sort of reality checks. Um, sometimes they're not very good, but often they are very, very insightful. Um, stock analysts, um, when we talk about Exxon, there's a 12 or 15 stock analysts who publish regularly on Exxon. Their reports are usually private, but you can probably get a few of them every uh, here and there. Um, we can buy some of them. Um, the transcripts of quarterly earnings calls. Every quarter, the company reports on its income and expenses and then does a call with those same stock analysts. And there is a published transcript on the web, usually very interesting information. Um, there are also proxy materials for annual meetings uh, when, they, when there's, an, there's an annual meeting every year for the shareholders and there's an extensive amount of information, particularly Exxon provides on their executive compensation that's useful. Um, there are often lawsuits and administrative proceedings and correspondence, all of which also gives you some more of a flavor of where the company is going. So what you're doing is really is you're integrating, you're using the 10K as the core document, and I'll show you why in a minute. Um, and then you're adding in these other things to give it to give it broader and broader context um, with the with the with the um, the main idea. In other words, of why we care. The main idea here is um, that the 10K is the company's description of itself. So it tells you what they think they're doing, where they think their strengths are, where they think their weaknesses are, and we look at it as it's best to know. Um, what the companies are thinking, how they see themselves, in order for us to propose, um, uh, uh, make proposals that are going to be meaningful um, to changing the, the company's behavior and, and that it will relate to their actual um, you know, business needs and business models in order to, um, in order to change their direction. Um, so the, the structure of the uh, of the 10K is in four parts, and what I'm going to do here is just go through with you the significant parts, which are on the left hand side of the um, of the um, of the screen right now, and and then pull out the essential things for how we're going to build this analysis on Exxon. So you see on down the left hand side is business purpose, risk factors unresolved comments, properties, legal proceedings. Those are all in the document and have um, important general information about the company because this part one is a more general um, part. And um, the thing that I want to call your attention to is the business purpose of Exxon. Exxon actually does three things. It explores and drills for um, oil and gas. It manufactures petroleum products. And it's a major manufacturer of petrochemicals uh, and transport of petrochemicals. Um, it also does a lot of research. Um, and so when you look at their books and records, you'll see a lot of the financial issues boil down to three or four different um, centers. And these are the basic centers uh, on what the company does. Um, the other important thing about ExxonMobil um, is that uh, it owns um, um, a lot of um, facilities around the world um, where they're mining, where they're drilling and extracting um, oil products. 
Um, and this is a uh, rather, this is from their books and records, and it's a somewhat complicated picture. Um, but if you go down to, this is proven reserves, which is what the company says it has under the ground that it has access to. And the standard is that it can um, extract this, um, these oil products for a profit. That's why they get put onto this chart. So if you go all the way down the right-hand column to the very bottom, you'll see that Exxon, um, as of their recent filing, had 19.9 billion um, barrels of oil or oil equivalents, um, which is one of the largest in the world. Um, but that number, you'll see, keep that in mind, the 19.9 billion, um, because it, it, rec it actually um, represents a decrease which is extraordinary in the history of the company. So <clears throat> the second part of the, uh, of the uh, 10K has to do with the, um, has to do with uh, more specific information about the company. It's stock information, as I referred to before, selected financial inf information, income and expenses, and then something called the management discussion and analysis. Um, that's where the company tells its story. It tells you what they're doing, what their main initiatives are, where they're seeing some troubles, how they think they're going to address those troubles. It's a very informative thing, and it's also very useful, of course, to look back and see what they've done in the past. Um, and then they also deal with quantitative and qualitative risk factors um, that have to do with the markets, commodity markets, interest rate markets, currency uh, markets. The other risk factors that we were referring to before are more sort of macro in general that have to do with policy like climate change and, and the like. Um, the last part of the part two is the financial statements, and those are the most essential uh, parts for what, what, what we've been doing, um, although for each company, depending on what you're doing, it'll be a little bit more, uh, more or less, uh, which, which form is important, which part of the form is important. So I wanted to just show you um, the selected financial information. This is what the company puts up. This is directly out of the most recent uh, 10K. And I messed it up a little bit with the highlighter just to show um, the kind of things you want to start looking at. The, if you take the top line, it says sales and operating revenue. That's how much Exxon takes in. And the line uh, over on the far right is 2012. That's the financial year. And 2016 is the most recent. You can see a considerable drop in income from 451 billion, that is, um, to 218 billion in a period of four years. That is a um, drop of more than half, and it is a um, uh, significant sign of distress in the company. When you go down a few levels to where it says net income, that's the income after expenses. You can see that Exxon made 44.8 billion in 2012. It made 7.8 billion in um, 2016, which is another considerable drop. Um, we skip down to cash dividends. Now, despite the fact that they're losing revenue and dropping in net income, if you take that a look at the 2012 to 2016, you see that cash dividends have actually gone up. It's an important part of the company's future. They want to make sure that the investors get at least some uh, amount out of the company. Um, it becomes a very big issue later on. Um, where we have additions to property, plant, and equipment, you see the 2012 they uh, invested $35 billion, and in 2016, they invested $16 billion. That's an indication uh, that the company um, is seeing less and less to invest in. And for a company like Exxon that has long-term um, investments to generate that kind of revenue, this, and that's an enormous amount of revenue, um, you're starting to see that over the long run, they're going to be actually generating less revenue because they're investing less money. Um, that's how this works. And then if you could just go down the long-term debt, um, for a minute, you'll see that the company in 2012 didn't borrow very much, well, not by their standards, $7.9 billion, and now they're up into the $28 billion. So they're, they're, the fact that they're losing money, not, they're, they're making less money, not making enough profit, still trying to invest, but they're also, the way they're doing it is, is one of the ways they're doing it is they're having to borrow the money rather than take it out of that ample cash that they've had over the years. Um, that's what that particular statement tells us. Then there's an income statement, and what this does is gives you three years instead of the five, and it it just summarizes a lot of things. A lot of this is duplicative, and you want to make sure when you're reading these things that they that they are consistent. 
this just shows you again that net income is down considerably over the last three years. Um, and then the cash flow statements, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but it is something that you, if you get more involved in this, it is the essential sort of sheet that tells you whether or not the company is actually um, having sufficient cash to cover its operating needs, its investments, the additions, the property, plant, and equipment is capital investment every year. Um, then you see their additions to long-term debt. They're adding cash to the system by borrowing it. And then they're having to pay out to the shareholders in dividends, which is about halfway down the page. Um, you see $12.4 billion in 2016 and then uh, 977 billion, which is another, a million. Um, so you basically, they have, um, they're putting out about 13 billion and they really don't have it to, to, to pay out to the shareholders. So that's, when you read these things, you begin to say, okay, this is how we can begin to put together a picture. And so this is a Naifa product, this particular chart. And it starts and shows the uh, price of oil, which is um, uh, something that you'll see mentioned in the paper uh, in their uh, 10K, but it's not as fleshed out as this. So we went back 10 years, not five years. Um, so we read all those other 10Ks and all the market information in order to present a full and complete decade worth of uh, income. The first set of numbers really shows you that the company is losing money, uh, uh, not making as much as it used to in, 20, in 2006. It would it cleared on net income 39 billion, and in 2016, 7 uh, billion, 0.8 billion. And you can see in 2011 they hit a peak of income at 486 uh, billion in revenues. It's now down to the 226, which is a um, uh, 260 billion dollar lo uh, loss of revenue. So the company is making less revenue, making less net income or income after expenses and borrowing more. That's what long-term debt says. So the, the next category sort of tells you it's called free cash flow. That's really how much money you got to pay the investors, right? And so if you go over to 2016 you know, and you go down to where we're looking at the free cash flow line, it's 10 billion, 10.25 billion. And then you go down to total distributions down a little bit lower um, to 2016, so the next to last line, and that's 13.3 uh, billion in what they paid out, which means they doesn't they don't have enough money really to pay um, the shareholders. That they're not running an operation that can cover expenses, cover debt, cover um, the uh, investment it needs to make, and then pay profit. Um, so it's a company that's in trouble. The odd thing about this is you're going to see later that they've been that way for a very long time um, and certain things happen to keep it well. So the, th the third and fourth section of the, um, of the company 10K, um, and I'm going to come back to these numbers, so uh, don't worry about it. Um, part three tells you um, it's the corporate um, ethics, it's the executive compensation for the company. Exxon also provides a lot of executive compensation in their proxy materials. It tells you uh, major transactions that the directors are involved in so that you don't you know whether or not there are any conflicts of interest and who the accountant is, very important. And then the fourth section is the actual independent accountant statement regarding the company and the additional financial information. Um, and I just want to, um, there's one very important thing that happened this year. This section is from the accountant's report um, and it says, <clears throat> As a result of very low prices, um, that certain amount of the oil that they had in the reserve section, which we talked about before, that the 19.9 billion um, would no longer um, could meet the test of reserves. In other words, they can't get it out in a financially uh, profitable manner, so they had to write off 4.3 billion, 3.5 in Canada, and 0.8 billion in the United States. So that number that was 19.9 had been um, almost 25. They wrote off about 20% of the company this year because of the low oil prices and uh, not being able to um, um, declare them as real reserves under the SEC laws. Um, so 
you have this picture um, and you have uh, some sense of the core issues in the 10K and then you want to step back and you want to say, who is this company and where do they stand? Um, and wh what does this mean for today and going forward? So when I talked before about looking at the stock market, um, you want to uh, Exxon Mobil, um, in the late 80s, um, seven of the top 10 companies in the Standard & Poor's 500 were oil companies. Oil and gas ruled the world economy in those days. Um, today there's only one, Exxon Mobil, and as you see, it's beginning to have some troubles. Um, Exxon from the 70s to early 90s drove the Standard & Poor's Index. It's not just an industry leader, it's a world economic leader. Um, from the late 1990s to 2014, they led the index, but they were no longer the world leader, and currently they are lagging the Standard & Poor's 500. And that's what this chart shows you. The, um, the uh, red line, when it is above the Standard & Poor's 500, means that Exxon was actually making so much money that it was driving the Standard & Poor's 500. It was driving the system, the world economic system, as a world leader. Um, it is currently no longer doing that since about right, mid-2013, and it is now a what's called a laggard in the industry. This is historically unprecedented, but it is what um, is happening to the company as we're going forward. Um, this is just a chart to show you some that oil stuff that I was talking about a little bit before. The company is highly dependent on the price of oil. It goes up and it goes down, uh, is the best way to put it, and it goes up and goes down for long periods. We're currently in a down cycle. We think that down cycle is more problematic than any other one in history. As you can see, they've more or less gone down since um, 2010 with some up periods, but mostly they're on a downward trajectory for the last seven years, um, and we would expect that to continue um, for the foreseeable future. Um, so you say to yourself, the company is, is having these troubles, and then you come back and boil down that 10K material, and you say, okay, how do we begin to make sense of this? Well, the revenues are down by $260 billion. Costs are up. I didn't go into a lot of that, but that's also in the 10K. Net income is down. Debt is up. That means they're borrowing more, making less. End of year cash. That's the cash they have left over. It used to be 30 almost 34 billion, it's now 3.7 billion. So it's down by you know 90%. Capital investment is declining. It means they're finding less they, they can invest in. And of course, the size of the company, the reserves, went from 25 um, billion barrels in 2015. That should be uh, 20 billion in 2016. That was my mistake. Um, so they dropped by 20% in size in one year. Um, this is just the same chart um, to begin to say, that's the fundamentals of the company. And then the question is, how good are they for investors? Um, and that's the sort of second section and third section. And I just want to show you what all these numbers do in terms of charts. First of all, we see, of course, that revenues are going down. A very clean, clear chart after all those numbers moving around, that the revenues are down and down appreciably. Um, so how do they, um, how they handle profits? Shareholders invest in Exxon in order to make money. That's why they're there. That's what Exxon has provided over many, many, many years as a major contributor. Um, however, over this last 10-year period, the overall payouts to shareholders have decreased from in the $40 billion a year to into the $7 billion a year, which means for small and large investors, it's a lot less. Um, they've kept their dividend payments up, and they've eliminated their stock buybacks so that yeah, um, the in, so that overall they're paying less, but the shareholder um, dividend is still important to the company and they try to maintain it. This is one way of looking at it where the, the blue column uh, on, the, um, on the left goes up every year. You can slightly, it goes up uh, gradually. Um, the darker uh, column went up and that was the buybacks of the stock. That's now dropped dramatically because the company's no longer, no longer buying back stock because they can't afford to do that. And then you have a look at that, the uh, blue lines um, um, one. It's the dividend and, and uh, buyback. 
aggregate, so or how much you know they are spending over the year, and then the green is how much net income they had. So over the years, they had enough net income, it looks like, to pay um, the uh, the profits out to the investors. But then you're seeing in 2015 and 2016 that's no longer the case, and it's in a particularly bad shape in 2016. Um, corporations also tend to look at whether or not they have the money to pay their shareholders through something called free cash flow. Um, and the easy way to understand that is they take the net income and then you reduce it by the amount of capital that you're investing every year. Um, and if you do that, you see that Exxon for the last five years didn't have enough money to pay the dividends. Um, and that's an important uh, factor um, in, the, uh, in the, the company's overall condition. So eventually, this is just another way of showing that the situation is dire. Um, and then you say, well, how do they do this for a period of five, ten years where they're essentially paying out to shareholders more than they actually have? Well, <clears throat> that oil price spike stuff that I was showing you, that creates ways in which cash comes in very heavily at some points and not much at others. So you can, at a good point in time for the company's cash flow, you can pay out. Um, to investors, even if you really don't have it as a stable source of money, at least within a given year, you hit a windfall. Um, there are cash withdrawals. We pointed out that they had $37 billion annually in their end-of-year reserves, and now it's down to three. So they're paying out the profits that way. They're increasing their debt, so they're borrowing to pay it. Um, these are all points of fiscal and financial distress for the company. Um, the price outlook go into this for a very long time, but the price outlook is not very good. So looking forward, they're saying to themselves, we have to begin to um, you know, tighten our belts. Um, this is a chart of how much money um, every oil company, a major oil company in the world is spending. You'll see they all are going down. They're all spending less. ExxonMobil is the same. Um, and they're spending less because they don't see much in future profits. That's a long-term way of looking at oil prices and saying that we're not, we don't see much of an increase into the future. Um, so the company wrote off 20% of its reserves. That's what this shows. Um, the oil sands in Canada were most of it. They were buying, 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 buying. But 2009, it went up. 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So for six or seven years and then before that, or before 2009, they were buying oil sands in Canada, which are a high-cost form of oil um, that has now been written down, as in they lost all the money without extracting much oil at all. They have some business there. They are making some revenues. Um, but that right now, they have just written off 20% of their company, which also happens to be about 10% of the world market. Um, and um, we're currently at $55 a barrel. This just gives you an idea of all, all of the kinds of oil they're mining. At $55 a barrel, much of it can't be mined. So this is there's probably more to come on this. Um, and the, uh, the recent write-down just shows that. Exxon's not the only company. Most other companies had already written down the Canadian oil sands, and others are writing down still further. Um, and that's because they just can't afford the, they bought the oil, they can't afford to pull it out of the ground. So the question from the point of view of the 10K is why did they write these assets off? In other words, they no longer exist. It used to be um, 24 billion um, barrels of oil, now it's 19. Well, the disclosure rules say that unless you can show that the price of oil covers your expenses, covers your ability to borrow, and covers your profits, you can't say that that oil is economically extractable. You can't say, you can't tell investors that that is a, um, a reserve that you own and that is accessible to them as a potential source of profit. So with the recent low prices and the continued outlook for low prices, they have to begin to um, um, make adjustments to what they're telling the investors or they're committing fraud. And that's really, there's some SEC investigations now, there's some attorney generals, and that's it's going right at this particular point. Did they wait too long to tell investors? Have they been misleading them? Particularly since other companies have been writing off the, their investments for the last few years. So Exxon, overall, when you get done looking at the 10K and get done looking at the market factors, you realize that this is a shrinking company. Um, and it also, as uh, most of you know, has a lot of climate change issues. 
that are remain unresolved and are highly contentious. So what have we done with this information um, since we've been developing it? Um, first of all, um, there's a big debate in the institutional investment community over whether or not um, um, funds should divest from oil and coal stocks. Um, we have been uh, adding this type of an analysis. Since Exxon is the leader, most of the other companies are in the same or worse shape. And so we've been pointing out that they're not making the kind of money that they used to make. And so for institutional investors, they need to take stock of that and they need to understand that this is going to um, um, uh, be a, is a problem now since they are making less money and will be a problem in the future and that from their point of view as fiduciaries, as the people who are responsible for the funds, they need to um, take action um, on this. Um, we've gotten some support from New York City who is formally beginning a study on how to, um, how to address this um, weakening position of the fossil fuels. Um, many Investors don't want to um, divest from the thing, but they do want to have continued discussions with the companies and accelerate that. This gives us, we did a report called Red Flags on Exxon that has a series of 20 or 30 questions that in, in investors can begin asking and we're getting some traction there. Um, this also um, points out to us that the um, climate controversy is not a con is a controversy that has to be taken in context. The company's disclosures, from the financial point of view, are somewhat secretive, and otherwise we would have heard about these weaknesses um, a couple of years ago. Um, just as their climate analysis has been somewhat secretive, and so what this really is showing, this financial picture, is adding to the notion that the company um, uh, carries out its business in terms of its investors in a, in a, in a fairly secretive manner. Um, we've been approached by class action lawyers who um, think this information that we have is pretty useful. I'm a former head of a pension fund and I understand how to bring class action suits. Um, we've been um, asked to various legislative forums where state and federal people are thinking of rules, regulations, hearings, exposés, legislation, um, and the like. Um, many, many, many editorial boards and business on journalism discussions we've been helping. Um, the climate movement um, around the world has been very interested in this kind of information. Um, and then recently we've been using it because there are more and more investors who are looking at putting their money into renewable energy. Um, and by we can now, with very good, uh, in a very uh, clear contrast, show that the renewable sector is performing in a manner that is far better um, than the fossil fuel sector and has been for quite some time. Um, that, I think, is pretty helpful for their investment strategies into the future. So <clears throat> to end this, um, the 10K is really the core document that we use because it's the company's story about itself. And we use it and build upon it to create a storyline that, that we come up with based on facts and analysis. The storyline for Exxon is clear. Exxon is a shrinking company and it must manage a declining operation in a declining market. Um, it is of less value um, to large institutional investors and small investors than it has been in the past. And our view is that those investors need to take heed because <clears throat> that's likely to continue. In terms of the climate discussion, this is information that is supplemental, but we think um, underscores the corporate culture of denial and secrecy that is a substantive criticism of their climate handling of the climate issue. And we see the same thing in the financial runnings of the company. Um, as the company recently has announced its write-off um, um, of 20% of its um, reserves worldwide, um, it's also announced that it's taking on new acquisitions. It's buying more things. It's buying um, oil reserves in Norway, Guyana, and throughout the United States. Um, and the question becomes, since they just wrote off about $20 billion, um, are these valid investments? Um, we, we don't know. We think shareholders need to start asking those questions. 
Um, will they be profitable in the future? It doesn't look like that to us. We don't know how they're justifying them. Um, we now, through this analysis, through the 10K analysis and the review of the documents, we now have standards to justify and to judge the company based upon the very standards that they use to talk to investors. And that's really sort of the upshot of what it is we're doing here. We can talk the, the same um, analytical, from the same analytical position as the company um, to show that it is um, not working in, in the investor's interest and of course in, in, for Exxon it's not working in the interest of uh, improving the climate. Yesterday the new CEO gave a speech um, and uh, to describe this new plan, this new investment strategy and um, most of the major business papers in the in the world said that they are losing confidence in this company um, and that it is um, less um, uh, believable than it has been in the past. So um, that's what we can do with the 10K analysis and some subsidiary um, things and that's what you know we use uh, this um, pretty liberally as we go through and work our analysis. This is one example. Thanks. Thanks Tom. That's a wonderful presentation. Um, Lots of great content, and uh, it's a little surprising just to see how quickly things have changed. So thank you for spelling that out for us. Uh, we have a couple of attendees um, on the line. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I didn't receive any through the chat, but please feel free to unmute your line now and share any questions with Tom. Any questions? Well, while we're waiting for anyone to speak up, um, I just wanted to follow up on Tom's note to say that um, he has a commentary uh, that's going to be out uh, on the IEFA website later this afternoon titled, Wall Street Gets the Exxon Heebie-Jeebies. So if anyone wants to continue to do some reading on Tom's thoughts on the company, please visit the IEFA website. Any other questions before we let everyone go today? Oh, here we go. We've got one here. So Tom, how long did it take you to pull together your analysis of Exxon's long-term profits? Well, um, it took uh, well. It, it, the problem, the problem, it's not that easy for me to answer it because it, it would take you longer than it would take me. Um, but it, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to do it. Um, so I, I when I was doing this um, analysis, I said to myself, "Well, when did you really start doing this?" First time I ever did any analysis like this, it was on the Mobile Oil Corporation in 1981. And I've been doing a lot of these since, so um, I, I, it's hard to sound so old. But anyway, so it took me a couple of weeks because I kind of know how to look at this. Um, and the point of, of um, but I hadn't looked at Exxon. Um, I, uh, as a prior uh, pension official, I looked at Exxon all the time because we were invested in them. Um, and then I left. And so I didn't really look at them for about eight or nine years. When I picked it up, I would say it took me you know, on and off about a month um, to do it. But I kind of know what to look for, and that's kind of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to help the learning curve for people who don't really understand it, but who can, who can what we're trying to say is you can bite into this, and you don't need to be a, a rocket scientist to do this. Um, and we can help, and others can help. Um, and it would probably take you uh, and another, maybe a person who had some facility with numbers, if you don't, but maybe one or two of you, it would probably take you um, two months with a little bit of, we could give you a little bit of help um, to do something like this for another company, um, and, and not full time either. Okay. And would you say that the same is true um, for your analysis of its financial situation? That was both long-term profits and financial situation was about two months. Yeah, I think you could do it in that time. I could probably do it a little faster. Okay. So um, another question from the same attendee. Why did you choose Exxon versus all the other targets that you could have chosen? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, Exxon to us um, 
A couple of reasons. Um, when you're an investor, you know, um, and and uh, a very large institutional investor like I was, um, you you can't you can't go after every every single company that's having a financial problem. That's impossible. Um, but you can, um, when the red flags are raised, particularly regarding an industry leader of an industry that has been the biggest industry in the world for as long as I as long as I was involved, um, you start to say that's where you pay attention, right? I mean, something as small as you know some penny stock you're not going to really care about, or a small junior oil sands company. Although I have written about them um, in uh, in Canada, so you look, you're saying, does the big does the leader have a have a financial problem? And if the leader has the financial problem. Then you start to say to yourself, well, what about everybody else? And of course, as we, yeah, the rest of the oil industry is having the same kind of problem. And we just want to show to the investment markets the saying, you don't have just a little problem here. You have a fundamental industry-wide problem that is structural. Exxon, as an example, allows you to make that case. And it's not disputable. OK. Um, as a follow-up to that, did you have a good sense of what you'd find? before you started? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is a, mm -hmm. um, the, um, been, the company I had uh, some involvement with since the early 90s and, uh, and the fossil fuel industry, just as an investor. And it became clear to us in the middle to late 90s that the industry would, would probably no longer be um, what it had been over the years. It might last a little while longer, but we didn't think it would continue. And when you're an, an investor, you could see that in other ways that's too lengthy to go into right now. Um, and then um, I did. I was more involved with coal because of Aifa's work um, since the year, uh, middle 2000s. And so I really didn't pay much attention to oil and gas. And then we got asked to look back at it. And the minute I picked it up, I said, the the, the um, the revenue numbers were were horrible, um, and the um, and then I was also asked to undertake studies on the Canadian oil sands. And when I looked at that, I just said to myself, "That was four years ago." I said, "This is not going to work." Um, and so we had a good indication um, from just a past experience um, that this was this was going on. And then this one, when we did the digging, we just it confirmed it confirmed everything, and I think even surprised me and how bad it is. Okay, great. Those are wonderful questions. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from our attendees? Or Tom, anything else that you'd like to add before we wrap up? Uh, no, I just, I realized I went through a lot of information fast. Um, and I, I hope that doesn't make people think that they, they can't do this. The, the, um, the actual documents are, uh, for Exxon, uh, some of the companies write them in opaque language and you can't understand them. Exxon, so many criticisms I have of them, their, their information is clear. Um, the statistical information I have trouble with, but the uh, actual narratives and stuff, you'll get the flavor for it. And it's true for most of the other companies that, that you might be involved with. It's worth it's worth the uh, investment of time, and the more you do, the stronger you become at it, and it becomes easier to do. Okay. So uh, um, another question for you here, Tom. If you had to choose an oil and gas pipeline company to analyze, which one would you look at? Well, we are looking at some <laughs> right now. Um, I think the Energy Transfer Partners um, team is um, a good uh, team to look at because I think it um, represents the um, uh, the overbuild phenomena that I think we're seeing in the other industry, uh, in the in the other uh, parts of the industry. And so, what's going on there is they have this great idea of building more and more and more pipelines, but they're going into this in a way where they're committing way too much capital, and some of these are just not going to work, and they will go bankrupt. And and it's largely a function of how we plan these things in the country, where the private sector just is allowed to build until it 
goes bust, and then there are real problems. But I think each, the the, the uh, energy transfers is one of the companies that are going to have its uh, some problems. There are a few others. Um, the, the conglomerate that's doing the Appalachian pipeline is also it's a different kind of a financial mechanism, but it's showing us the same things. Um, so there are a number of them that I would I would look at, but those are those are two that come to mind immediately. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've also written on Trans Canada, um, which is the uh, X, XL pipeline, and we'll probably pick that up again uh, um, uh, uh, post the Trump decision to move forward with it. We still think the investment climate is not that good for that that uh, at that pipeline. Okay. So continue to uh, tune into AIFA's website and Twitter and Facebook to learn more about reports that are forthcoming, right? Yes, we uh, keep them coming. Excellent. All right. Well, any other questions before we go? Those were a lot of wonderful ones, so thank you. All right, well, I think that we're done for today. Um, again, you will be able to find this presentation available on the IEFA website and also online on YouTube. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and thank you, Tom, for your presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.